Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. Thanks for tuning in this morning. We're going to continue our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power by R.W. Thompson. And as we left the program yesterday, we were discussing whether or not the supposed temporal power of the Pope is a right conferred upon the papacy by divine right, by Christ, as asserted by the papacy, that the temporal power of the Pope was conferred upon Peter, the chief of the apostles, and that the Pope is the successor of Peter, or if this so-called divine right is merely a human invention. Now, before we continue, I want to make a statement. The papacy, by my estimation, my studied estimation, is that the papacy has no authority in the world, no legitimate authority anywhere in the world, either spiritually or temporally. The Pope is no priest of Christ. He is Antichrist. He has no spiritual power, no legitimate spiritual power. Instead, the papacy is that human agent, that human agency through which Satan seeks to fulfill his false prophecy of Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15, the five I wills of Satan, where he will exalt his throne above the stars of God. The papacy is literally the human agency through which Satan seeks to exalt his own throne above that of God's. That's the role that the papacy plays in the world, to usurp the throne of God. Now, the temporal power of the Pope, which has been the subject of the discussion of this book almost throughout, derives that temporal power from the spiritual power. And if, as I assert, the papacy has no legitimate spiritual power anywhere on the earth, then he has no temporal power. No spiritual and no temporal. The Pope has no legitimate authority over anyone in the world except those who simply acquiesce to his blasphemous assertions. But the subject of our discussion is the temporal power of the Pope. Where did it come from? What Was it divinely inspired? And as I've already said, no, it is not divinely inspired. Or is it a human invention? It's a very important discussion. Because most of the world who would de deny the Pope his temporal power gladly give him his spiritual power of which he has none. So the whole world wanders after the beast. Those who believe the Pope is both a priest and a king and representative of Christ on the earth are wholly deceived. Those who believe the Pope is no temporal prince but is the successor of Peter or the the chief spokesman or the spiritual leader of the Christian faith are likewise deceived. Now, with all of that stated, we'll return to the book, chap, uh, 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 page 243, if you're reading along. We'll begin at the top of the page, page 243, dealing specifically with the temporal power. Is it divinely inspired, or is it a human invention? It says, Some of the papal writers are disposed to go behind the concessions made to the, the Church of Rome by Constantine and to search for the temporal power in the ownership of ecclesiastical property before that time. All right. Now, let me explain before we continue. The Pope claims, as a demonstration of his temporal power, that he has that temporal power over his dominions. And his dominions are the church property, the Roman Catholic church property. 
that that property belongs to the Roman Catholic Church, and he is the ruler of that church and possesses both spiritual and temporal power over those churches, that property. That makes him a king of that property. And if the Pope can extend his property from, say, the papal states or the local churches to all the land and all the seas of the world, then he is both a spiritual and a kingly authority over the whole world. So if you're going to extend the temporal power, the kingly power of the Pope over the globe, you've got to start somewhere, right? So he started with asserting that his temporal power was derived from that which he exercised over his own property, the Roman Catholic churches. But there's a catch. There's a little problem for the papacy in that there were churches in, in Christian churches in existence in the world long before the Roman Catholic Church, and they owned property, yet they submitted to the temporal power of the local the local governments. So it's no precedent that the Pope is king over property. Because if it's a Christian church, it submits to the governments. It submits its temporal uh, observance to the laws of the land in which those churches reside. So, with that understanding, we'll continue. It says, a book has lately been written in Germany, translated and published in the United States, enforcing this view by a variety of arguments. It is here called, The Patrimony of Peter, the Supreme Jurisdiction of the See of Rome, and it is said that Ignatius referred to it as a presidency of charity, when, as this author alleged, he has he assigned to the Roman church supremacy over all the other churches. This argument, if it proves anything, proves too much for the advocates of the temporal power of the Pope. For at the time Ignatius wrote, all the churches in Asia and Africa were the owners of ecclesiastical property, equally with that at Rome. And some of the Asiatic churches as those at Jerusalem, Antioch, and etc., had been such owners before there was anything like an organized Christian church known or heard of at Rome. Hence, if this ownership conferred any temporal power higher than the mere right to use and enjoy church property, the other churches possessed it in the same degree as the Roman, and no superiority could arise out of that cause. But it really proves nothing, for the plain reason that in no age of the world have civilized nations ever recognized any temporal power in the sense of that claimed for the popes as derived from the mere individual or corporate right to hold and enjoy property. The right to hold real property is attached primarily to the sovereignty and is enjoyed by individuals or corporations by grant from it. That is, the, 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 governing na the, the, gover the government of the region. Okay? And when it is taken by force strong enough to make resistance successful. Okay? And it says, when referred by grant or a form of concession, there is no abatement of the sovereign power that is the government, which for all the purposes of government over both the property and its possession and its possessor means as before. So nothing when 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 churches uh, own property and become corporations, that corporation is granted by the state, by the sovereign. Okay? No, at no time in history was the leader of a church ever considered a sovereign in the terms of a, a temporal authority. It could, get, could not grant its own jurisdiction. It could not grant its own authority. 
So the, the, the papacy is, is, is an aberration when it claims tempor, uh, temporal authority by divine right. If it's true, it's the first ch Christian church ever in existence that claimed its own temporal power. And it should be recognized by Protestants, especially in this country, that the Pope has no supreme authority, at least over temporal things, and as I assert, over spiritual things as well. He's not a Christian. He's an anti-Christian, okay, a counterfeit Christian, a usurper, a blasphemer, and he's destined for the gates of hell. So why would we defer any, make any reference to him? Yet he rules the world. He rules the governments of the world. That's the new world order. Now the, the author continues, he says, Nor is it true that Ignatius recognized any such supremacy in the Roman church. And oh, by the way, don't be confused. This Ignatius is not Ignatius Loyola. This is a, an early Christian. This is a follower of Jesus Christ. And I believe where he, he was a martyr. We'll continue uh, with our discussion. And Ignatius' name comes up often. It says, Nor is it true that Ignatius recognized any such supremacy in the Roman church, as is asserted, with such apparent confidence by this author. Fortunately, the recent publication of the writings of the Anti-Nicene Fathers will enable any diligent inquirer to investigate these matters for himself, and thus to avoid being misled by second-hand authorities, which, as Sarpy tells us, are often culled and clipped at Rome. Remember the manufactory at Rome? To make them express not what the authors meant, but what the papacy desires. Ignatius addressed his epistle to the Romans to the church which, quote, presides in the place of the region of the Romans, unquote, thus showing that whatever was the nature of the presidency possessed by the bishops of Rome at that time, it was limited to the region round about Rome and did not extend into other regions. And in the same sense, he salutes all the other churches to which his epistle was addressed, those at Ephesus, Magnesia, Trallus, Philadelphia, and Smyrna. He wrote his epistle to the Romans while on his way to Rome from Antioch, where he was sent by Trajan to be thrown to the wild beasts. His chief object was to notify them that he was rejoicing at the dispensation which was about to enable him to, quote, fight the beasts at Rome, unquote, that is, to suffer martyrdom for the cause of Christ. He said nothing from which the presidency of Peter can, by possibility, be inferred, not even by the most ingenious torture of his language. When he spoke of the authority to issue commands to the Roman Christians, he referred to Peter and Paul unitedly, and not to Peter alone and then only for the purpose of contrasting himself with them by being apostles and he a follower. When elsewhere he spoke of the obligation of obedience, he admonishes each particular church addressed by him to show it, to show it that is, their uh, obedience to its own bishop. To the Ephesians he said, quote, you should run together in accordance with the will of the bishop who by God's appointment rules over you, unquote. After counseling the Magnesians to revere their, quote, most admirable bishop, unquote, he said to them, quote, Be ye subject to the bishop and to one another as Christ to the Father, that they may be a unity according to God among you, unquote. To the Tralians, he said, quote, Be ye subject to the bishop as to the Lord, unquote. He commanded to the Philadelphians their bishop, with whom he desired them to maintain union, telling them, quote, Where the shepherd is, there do ye as sheep follow, unquote. And further exhorting them to unity, said, quote, Be ye followers of Paul and the rest of the apostles, 
even as they also were of Christ, unquote, making no mention whatever of Peter, but directly excluding, almost by express word, all idea of his primacy or superiority. To the Smyrnians, he said, quote, See that ye all follow the bishop, and let no man do anything connected with the church without the bishop, and wherever he was, there, sh there they should be, because, quote, wherever Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church, that is, the universal body of believers, and not merely the Church of Rome of whose power to govern the other churches he seems never to have had a thought. So it's quite obvious that this Ignatius lends no authority whatsoever upon this so-called Bishop of Rome, the Pope, and that each individual local church had its own bishop, and he admonished Christians, Bible believers, true believers in Christ to follow their bishops, their individual bishops. And before anyone gets confused by his reference to this Catholic Church, I want to reiterate for those that have never heard it before. When I talk about the Catholic Church, you may assume that I am talking about the Roman Catholic Church. But Catholic, the word Catholic means universal, and it is used by many authors to describe the true church of Jesus Christ as the Catholic or universal church. So this author uses that term, Catholic church, to describe the true believers in Christ. I never mix the two as just a matter of a means not to confuse my listeners. Again, when I use the word Catholic, I use it in reference to the Roman Catholic Church. If you hear me make mention of the Catholic Church, it's never to describe the universal true body of believers. It is only used by me to describe the Roman Catholic Church. And I just leave the body of Christ with its own rightly given name, the body of Christ, and I don't use any of Rome's terms to describe them. All right. <clears throat> now continuing, it says, and in further and still more convincing proof that he did not recognize the primacy of Peter or of the Roman church, he begged the Romans in his epistle to them to remember the church at Smyrna in their prayers since instead of him, it then had no bishop, but only the Lord, quote, for its shepherd, unquote. Which could not have been the case if the bishop of Rome was, and is, as is now pretended, the shepherd of the whole flock, the universal shepherd. And in his letter to Polycarp, bishop of Smyrna, he begged him, and not the bishop of Rome, to assemble a council, to elect a bishop for the church at Antioch in his place, and to, be, and to, quote, bestow on him the honor of going to Syria, unquote, which he undoubtedly, which he undoubtedly would not have done if Rome had been the seat of Episcopal primacy, and if the bishops there had possessed what is now so dogmatically and imperiously claimed for them, quote, the plentitude of power to feed, rule, and govern the universal church, unquote. Yes, that, that's what the papacy claims. Divine right, plentitude of power to feed, rule, and govern the universal church. That is the new world order to, that the Pope will feed and rule and govern <clears throat> the universal church. When you eat, you will eat from his table. If you do not feed from his table, you will do not be denied food. That's the social services that are available in this country today. You have to be a participant in this Roman system 
to have any liberty and to have any uh, of the social services available from our government. It's a Roman government. It's controlled by Rome. They, they feed us, they rule us, and they govern over us by divine right. We are under the false belief that we elect our officials, that our government is benevolent, when it is the opposite. It is an agency of this human agency called the papacy, which seeks to exalt his throne above the stars of God and to rule in God's stead. The government of the United States is a papal government, and it is establishing the Roman Catholic Church's or the papacy's social program for the world. I'm sure for those who are hearing this for the first time are rather shocked and incredulous. But as we continue with our reading and discussion of this book and many other books on Inquisition Update, the reality will become stark and apparent. He continues, and thus we find the precise fact to be that Ignatius is authority against rather than for the existence of what is now called the patrimony of Peter, the temporal power of the Pope, at least up until the year 107 A.D., which is supposed to, be, which is supposed to have been the year of his martyrdom. This same German author, in further support of his views, refers to the action of two of the pagan emperors to prove that the patrimony of Peter, or the temporal power of the Pope, was recognized by them as existing in the 3rd century. He says, quote, Alexander Severus decided a lawsuit respecting a piece of property in favor of the Roman Catholic Church, treating it as a, quote-unquote, corporate body, and that, quote, the Emperor Aurelian, though an enemy and persecutor of the Church, recognized the supremacy of the Pope over all the Christians of the Empire, unquote. If such assertions as these were not gravely set forth as arguments in a standard work of the Roman Catholic Church, and designed by its rep republication to influence public opinion in the United States, they would scarcely be worthy of notice. And it is they only, uh, and it is they only serve to show how utterly indefensible is the claim of temporal power at the time refer uh, uh, referred to. Although Alexander Severus was not yet, his mother was a Christian, as we learn from Origen, and his conduct toward the Christians may, in some measure, be attributed to her influence. As an exhibition of his liberality, probably induced by her, he issued an edict of toleration, prohibiting any violence against his subjects on account of their religion. That the church held property in Rome during his reign as a recognized corporation must be true, for Roman corporations were provided for and protected by Numa Pompilius as early as the, about the 40th year of Rome. When the laws of the Decembers, remember as we read the book uh, 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 Code Word Barbalon, P.D. Stewart lays out one form of government practiced by the Romans, the Decembers. It says, when the laws of the Decembers, or the Twelve Tables, were engraved on brass and fixed upon the public view, full protection was given to all these corporations, including, of course, such as the church afterward became. Therefore, the decision of so liberal a prince as Alexander Severus, merely in support of the right of the church to hold property as a corporation, proves only two things. When the laws of the Decembers, uh, the, the Twelve Tables, were engraved on brass and fixed up in public view, full protection was given to all these corporations including, of course, such as the church afterward became. Therefore, the decision of so liberal a prince as Alexander Severus, merely in support of the right of the church to hold pri uh, property as a corporation, proves only two things. First, that the Christians were not persecuted during his reign. And second, that he administered the laws with integrity and impartiality. 
He would in like manner have maintained the same right in any other corporation as he did, in fact, in all the pagan corporations. Hence his decision amounts to nothing as an argument in favor of the temporal power of the popes. It literally proves the reverse, if anything, because it, show, it, it serves to show that the Roman Catholic Church, instead of deciding upon its own right to property in Rome by its own hierarchical authority, as it now pretends it has always done, was compelled, like all other corporations of Rome, to submit it to the emperor and to abide his decision because he possessed the superior temporal jurisdiction of the state. The bishop of Rome was then a subject, not in any sense a sovereign. Nor does the papal theory derive any more or better support from what was done by the emperor Aurelian. He was for a while disposed to favor Christians, but at last, according to Lacantius, issued bloody edicts against them. The case of Paul of Sam, uh, Samosata came before him to be judged, probably before he became a persecutor. The fact that he finally decided such a case, involving heresy in one of its aspects, which was an offense against the laws of the church and not against those of the empire, is perfectly conclusive against the claim of papal supremacy at Rome at that time. That is, up until the pontificate of Felix I, between the year 270 and 275 A.D., when the case was, was decided. It proves beyond any reasonable ground of, for controversy that, as during the previous reign of Alexander Severus, the Roman Catholic Church and its bishop were entirely subordinate to the emperor and the laws of the empire and that this subordination extended even to the ecclesiastical matters, the case adjudged by Aurelian abundantly shows, as the, hist the history of the same case also shows, that the jurisdiction of the Roman bishop was limited, as it was in the time of Ignatius, to, quote, the place and the region of the Romans, unquote. So what about this universal sovereignty of the Pope? It's a human invention. Rather, more correctly, it is to be said that it is a satanic invention. Remember, as I said at the beginning of the broadcast, the papacy is nothing but the human agency through which Satan seeks to fulfill his false prophecy of Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. And all of this presumption that the Pope is somehow the vicar of Christ on the earth and is chief of princes falls flat on its face. The Roman Catholic Church uses all these examples to prove the sovereignty of the popes, when in fact those very examples prove the opposite. And if we can wrap our brains around the idea that the pope is no temporal prince, and that he's arrogated to himself some divine right authority to rule the, the world, then might we also question, might we also legitimately suspect that his spiritual power is also a presumption, a usurpation, and let me be frank, a lie, a damnable, blasphemous lie. That's the assertion of Inquisition Update. And what ramification does that have for an American? When we stop to realize that the Vatican through her Jesuit priests and the Roman Catholic hierarchy in this country, have exercised the Pope's supposed temporal power in taking control of politics in this country and changing the laws of this country to make them conformable to the Pope's great hope 
of a new world order where he is the sovereign of sovereigns, the king of kings. At this point, we have to realize that it's time to go through all the laws of this country one at a time and cast out every single one of them that props up the, po the Pope's temporal power, that props up the Pope's spiritual power. And I assert that once done, there won't be much left of American civil law. It's all built on the premise. All these laws are the instruments through which the Pope seeks to rule the world. Our government has literally become a slave to the papacy, passing laws, conferring benefits upon its citizens that are simply given for no other reason than to entrap us into a system out of which we cannot extricate ourselves, that we pay taxes till poverty strikes to prop up this system that is designed for no other purpose than to enslave us and to make us wittingly or unwittingly, voluntarily or otherwise, acquiesce to the Pope's supreme authority in the world. The United States government is not a benevolent government. It is a malevolent government. It is a Luciferian government. And it pays its ultimate allegiance to a foreign potentate, a foreign usurper, the biblical and historical Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. The entire system of government in this country is built on the Roman model. And this goes back to what we've said so many times on Inquisition Update. God told us the ending from the beginning. He clearly told us through the prophet Daniel that there would only be four kingdoms upon the earth before Christ returns. The Babylonian, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and now the Roman. That Roman power was in power at the time of the birth of Christ. It crucified Christ. It crucified all of its believers all of his believers, it has persecuted God's people up until the present time, and now it, is, it has grown so big that no one seems to recognize it for what it is. It's still that Roman power. It's still in power. It still controls the kings of the earth, and it still persecutes God's people and enslaves God's people And if not, then Christ has already returned. Because at the end of that prophecy, it says that that last fourth and final beast upon the earth would be destroyed. And that Christ would set up a kingdom that would never end. Now the Pope and all his prelates and all of his subservient government officials in this country would say, we're building that kingdom of Christ. It's a global kingdom of Christ. It's called the New World Order, and you ought to be a part of it. But no, it's a human invention that you're building. It is a satanic invention that you're building. It's a global empire for the biblical and historical Antichrist, and you're a servant of Satan. You're not a servant of Christ. This is not a Christian nation. This is an anti-Christian nation. I wait for my king to come from the heavens. He is no earthly king. And he has no earthly kingdom. Yes, he's building his kingdom out of men and women on this earth, but we have no allegiance to a human government. We have no loyalty to a human government. God set the limitations for the civil power. Do you know what he said? He gave him a sword and told us to obey the civil government. But what did he say about the civil government? That it was supposed to reward good and punish evil. That's the sum total of the legitimacy that God gave the civil power. To reward good and to punish evil. 
But what do the governments of the world do? They reward evil and punish good. That's why God's people have been on the the fire been the subject of firing squads and guillotines and nooses for all of its history. You say the American government is oppressive? You're absolutely right. They're following the Roman model. And if you're one of those that think we need more and bigger government, you're simply feeding the beast. You want more entitlements? You want more benefits? You want to pay more taxes? so that the Pope's government of this country can redistribute your wealth and give it to the wicked of this country? This can in no way be called a Christian society. It claims the trappings of Christianity, but it proves otherwise by its actions. Its words do not meet with its actions. And that's because of the Roman influence. That's because of the Jesuit and Roman Catholic hierarchical influence upon our government. No government of man will ever establish Christ's righteousness on the earth. It's going to take Christ himself in person to do that. And if you somehow have a, a misplaced loyalty in your government and you trust your government for a handout, but by now, if you're paying any attention to what's really going on in this country, you ought to have come to the conclusion that uh, they're going to renege on their promise. So what did they do with the money? They put it in the general fund. And what did the general fund do? Fought papal proxy wars all over the world. Spent your money that you gave to the government to redistribute for the benefit of the poor and what they did with it, they went out and waged war against God's people. And you call that a Christian government? The government of the United States is apostate. When will somebody with the voice and the bully pulpit stand up in Congress and condemn the government of the United States for becoming the papal proxy warrior that it is, for working its people's fingers to the bone to pay taxes for the benefit of a foreign potentate. You won't hear it come from Washington, D.C. It's going to be from the little people out in the middle of nowhere inspired by the Holy Spirit of God to tell the truth no matter what it costs. Your faith in the American government is misplaced. Our faith belongs to Christ and Christ only. The book continues. Paul of Samosata was bishop of Antioch in Syria and denied the divinity of Christ. For this a council was assembled at Antioch to try him without the agency of the church or the bishop of Rome, which would scarcely have been the case if the supremacy now asserted had then existed. According to Eusebius, this council was composed of the bishop of Caesarea, Pontus, Tarsus, Iconium and Jerusalem and many presbyters and deacons, all from the Asiatic churches and none from Rome. From Firmilian, Bishop of Caesarea, as its president. Paul was convicted of heresy but not excommunicated in consequence of a promise that he would retract his error. Having failed, however, to do this, a second council was assembled at the same place in the year 270, which deposed Paul and elected another bishop to succeed him and who took possession of the see of Antioch. All these proceedings were conducted from first to last by the Asiatic churches 
and the Roman church had no connection whatever with them. A bishop was tried for heresy, convicted, excommunicated, and removed from office, and another elected to fill his place by these early fathers, and yet Rome was not consulted. But Paul did not submit without some show of resistance. As he was, quote-unquote, unwilling to leave the building of the church, in other words, he wouldn't get off the church property, that is, claimed the right to occupy the house and the premises, an appeal was taken to the emperor, Emperor Aurelian, not the bishop of Rome. An appeal was taken to the emperor Aurelian, says Eusebius. And why to the emperor and not to the church or the bishop of Rome? The answer is simple and conclusive, because neither the Roman Catholic Church as a corporation nor the Pope as a bishop had any jurisdiction over temporal affairs, even to the extent of deciding upon the right of an heretic bishop to occupy church property, nor any jurisdiction to review or decide upon the proceedings of the bishop of Asia, the bishops of Asia. Both the Church of Rome and its bishop, as well as the other churches and bishops throughout the empire, were subject to the civil laws of the empire. And because of this subordination, and because both Antioch and Rome were within the empire, all the parties concerned were compelled to abide by the judgment of the emperor. Quote, And he decided, says Eusebius, most equitably on the business, ordering the building to be given up and those to whom the bishop of Italy and Rome should write, unquote. Cormenon records his decision in somewhat different language thus, quote, The prince decided that the possession of the Episcopal palace retained to those who entertained relations with the bishop of Rome and the other prelates of Italy, and that Pope Felix, having refused to hold communion with Paul of Samosata, he should consequently be driven from his see, unquote. These two statements, however, are substantially the same. That is, that the emperor decided in favor of those Christians at Antioch who were in fellowship, not merely with the bishop of Rome, but with the other prelates of Italy, who unitedly represented the Italian churches, including that of Rome, with the others. Nothing could have been more natural. For although both Rome and Antioch were in the empire, Aurelian, a pagan prince, could, of course, have no other ideas of Christianity than such as he derived from direct and immediate intercourse with his Roman and Italian subjects. Therefore, upon the question whether or not Paul forfeited his right as a bishop in Asia by a violation of Christian faith, he referred to them because they were in Rome and its vicinity and deciding and decided according to their definition of orthodoxy, they occupying merely a secondary or advisory position. But to say of this as this author does, that it was a recognition by Aurelian of the, quote, supremacy of the Pope over the Christians of the empire, unquote, is an assumption wholly unwarranted by the facts. The case of Paul of Samosata proves the very reverse. And the most that can be fairly said, if not all that can be said, in reference to the Church of Rome up to the time of Aurelian, is that it was permitted by law to hold property, as also were all the other corporations and churches throughout the empire. Whatsoever temporal power was necessary to enable it to hold and enjoy this property, it possessed no more, no less. The Bishop of Rome, as its ecclesiastical head, did not possess one single element of sovereignty. Let me read it again. The Bishop of Rome, the Pope, as an ecclesiastical head, did not possess one single element of temporal sovereignty. And he still does it. Not one iota of temporal sovereignty does he legitimately hold in this world. And yet he's the head of the new world order. He's the king of kings. He rules over the kings of the earth. 
Why? Because all the world wonders after the beast, just as the, the Apostle John said. The world has acquiesced to this man-made, no, Luciferian doctrine that the Pope is the governor of the world, the temporal and spiritual governor of the world. All the world wonders after the beast. We all follow after his example. We all bow and knee to his authority. Most of us unwittingly, but yet we do. When it becomes apparent to the American people who really controls our government, there will be rebellion. Revolution. A just overthrow of an unjust government. This author, however, after attempting to prove that the temporal power existed in the time as of Alexander Severus and Aurelian, seems himself persuaded that the right was a mere shadowy one. For immediately after he asserts that it was formally recognized by an edict of Constantine. Constantine did not enter Rome until the year 312 during the pontificate of Melchiades, which was about a quarter of a century after the death of Aurelian and about three quarters of a century after that of Alexander Severus. If therefore the popes possessed temporal power in the time of either of these last named emperors, it must have been only partial and limited and no necessity of, for a formal recognition of it by an imperial edict would have existed. But passing by any attempt to convict him of inconsistency by a critical review of his language, let us see whether this pretended grant of Constantine will stand the test of investigation and whether there's any sufficient foundation for it to rest upon. Now, we're talking about now the donation of Constantine, this so-called giving over of his empire to the bishop of Rome, this arrogant, blasphemous claim that the papacy then became king of kings, an emperor. And, and, and together with his so-called spiritual authority, he now had kingly authority. And that this is all just the fulfillment of divine right. That Constantine recognized the Church of Rome as an existing ecclesiastical corporation, as some of his predecessors has done, is unquestionably true. And it is also true that he went further than any of them in strengthening and protecting it. He is called the Christian Emperor by way of distinction. But when we shall come at another place to look into the history of this connection with the Roman clergy, we shall find that his only claim to this title consists in the fact that he was the friend and patron of the ecclesiastical organization which gave him its support when he marched his army from Britain and Gaul into Italy to supplant the reigning emperor and seize upon the empire. The pretext that on his way to Rome as a pagan prince, he saw a flaming cross in the heavens bearing the inscription, Under this sign thou shalt conquer, answered its end in a superstitious, aid, uh, superstitious age, but is scarcely entitled to the place it has received in history. The fact is, he, carried very li he cared very little for Christianity beyond the use to which he put its professors, which was to build up and secure his own power.